Hello people of YouTube, Dane here, and today I'm going to be reviewing this, which is Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. So, I haven't actually done a classic review on this channel, so this should be an interesting challenge, I guess. Um, I buddy read this with Catalyst Reads, and I also read this as one of my books for Time Hopathon. So I will link below to these people and more info and all that jazz. I will read you the blurb quickly, and then we're going to get going. So, the compelling story of two outsiders striving to find their place in an unforgiving world. Drifters in search of work, George and his simple-minded friend Lenny have nothing in the world except each other and a dream. A dream that one day they will have some land of their own. Eventually they find work on a ranch in California's Salinas Valley, but their hopes are doomed as Lenny, struggling against extreme cruelty, misunderstandings and feelings of jealousy, becomes a victim of his own strength. Tackling universal themes, friendship and a shared vision, and giving voice of, um, to America's lonely and dispossessed, Of Mice and Men has proved one of Steinbeck's most popular works, achieving success as a novel, a Broadway play, and three acclaimed films. It also won the Nobel Prize for Literature. So that's quite interesting because I actually went into this blind, I guess. I didn't read the blurb. I had no idea what it was about. I did read the introductory essay. But funnily enough, a lot of the themes it's mentioned here are ones that I kind of picked up on. It is very much... It's kind of a tale of the underdogs, it's a tale of people who have a dream and it's kind of the American dream except not all, the American dream doesn't always work out, you know, you, you can go to the land of the free and you can work hard every day and put your all into it and still end up dying in a gutter and I think that's what this book captures and it was very controversial when it came out in part I think because it kind of casually uses swear words and things like that, it talks about you know, uh, it basically, it, it kind of slut shames somebody, to be honest. But yeah, friendship is very much a theme in this as well. And just these, you know, these grand, grand visions that we all have of where we'd like to be in the future. And it doesn't always, doesn't always go well. So this has got an introduction in it by Susan Schillinglaw. And I read that before I go into, I went into it. I usually do that anyway in classics. I do tend to read the introductions first. I just think it gives you more context on the book when you're reading it. And I guess there are spoilers in the introduction, but I, you know what I mean? I just sort of zoned out of them. I'm, I'm not too worried, but I, either way, if you read it before or afterwards, I would recommend reading the introduction, especially if you have this, the Penguin Classics edition. I think what's interesting is there's kind of the popular popular culture fact, I guess, that the original type title of, of Mice and Men was something that happened. And it says here in the introduction, to read of Mice and Men, as Steinbeck intended, is to keep firmly in mind its original title, Something That Happened, a phrase expressing the non-judgmental acceptance that imprints his best work of the 1930s and early 40s. When reading of Mice and Men, we are asked to acknowledge the inevitability of a situation in which two men, each with a particular weakness and need, cling to the margins of an unforgiving world. It is a parable about commitment, loneliness, hope and loss, drawing its power from the fact that these universal truths are grounded in the realistic context of friendship and a shared dream. It is the energy of that friendship, real but hardly sentimental, that changes this richly suggestive and emotional text. They've uh, missed the closing comma of that, look. So a little bit more context as well that, I mean, specifically, I know this is hardly a review, I'm literally reading from the introductory essay, but I kind of combed out the bits that I thought would be interesting to share with you guys, so it says here. Indeed, the episode that inspired of Mice and Men probably occurred on one of these ranches. Working as a bindle stiff himself in the early 1920s, Steinbeck saw a huge and troubled man kill a ranch foreman. Lenny was a real person, he told a New York Times reporter in 1937. He's an insane asylum in California right now. I worked alongside him for many weeks. He didn't kill a girl, he killed a ranch foreman. Got sore because the boss had fired his pal and stuck a pitchfork right through his stomach. I hate to tell you how many times I saw him do it. We couldn't stop him until it was too late. It was the kind of episode that Steinbeck filed for later use, a vivid incident with wide-ranging implications. It's funny, the actual introductory essay to this book is almost as long as the book itself, because it is quite short. In today's standards, you would call it a novella, and that makes it a great classic to get started with, if you're new to classics, because it's an enjoyable little story. And while it is about the friendship between these two characters, there is very much a plot to it as well, which is very interesting. And it's just not too long and you don't have to you don't have to overthink it. You can if you want, you can analyze it, or you can just enjoy it for just what it is, just a fun little book. What's interesting that I didn't know is that the title of the book comes from a Robert Burns poem, and it says here, The poem tells of an unfortunate field mouse whose home is flattened by a plough. But mousy, thou art no thy lane, improving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes are mice and men, gang after glay, and leers now but grief and pain for promised joy. So when he says gang after glay, that's Scottish for go off the rye, basically. But I thought that was interesting. And mice, mice are symbolic in this as well. 
And you'll see why if you read it. So Of Mice and Men was published as a Book of the Month Club selection in March 1937. It said uh, it sold briskly, average sales of a thousand copies a day in the first month. And in company with How to Win Friends and Influence People and Gone with the Wind, it hit bestseller lists around the country, firmly establishing Steinbeck's growing reputation. But I think that's cool. It gives you some context as to when it was actually published, what else was being published at the same time. And also, I didn't know that Book of the Month had been going for that long. So I think it's super cool knowing that, that knowing that Book of the Month is such this historic establishment, effectively. I think that's super cool that booktubers are, are getting Book of the Month books as well. Unfortunately, they don't deliver overseas. Steinbeck actually envisioned it as kind of a play as well, so he wrote it as a novel with the play format in mind so that it could be transferred to it as well. Some interesting thing you'll hear about the dialogue, uh, the dialogue that he writes. And funnily enough, I was reading it and I was like, this is kind of how Stephen King writes, like with the dialect and you know the phonetic spelling and all this stuff. And I can kind of see, I could imagine that King must have read quite a lot of Steinbeck and when he was a young, younger man, you know, and, and picked up on that. It says here, and in part Steinbeck's naturalistic dialogue offended and continues to offend. The novel is one of the most frequently banned by school boards throughout the country. The lines, even those delicately censored for the stage and film, are gritty. Yet Steinbeck adamantly defended his dialogue, both in Of Mice and Men and, two years later, in The Grapes of Wrath. For too long, Steinbeck wrote his godmother late in 1939, the language of books was different from the language of men. To the men I write about, profanity is adornment, an ornament, and is never vulgar, and I try to write it so. Tough, yet lyrical, realistic, yet symbolic. These words describe both the prose that Steinbeck perfected in the late 1930s and the artistic vision that produced his most unsettling trio, trio of novels, In Dubious Battle, Of Mice and Men, and The Grapes of Wrath. So that's it for the intro essay. I just think it adds a lot of context that's worth bearing in mind. We've got a note on the text as well, so I thought I'd just share this. So it just says that the text of this edition of, of Mice and Men is based on the Compass Books edition issued in 1963 by the Viking Press Inc. So in case you're wondering which edition I'm reading. So over the first few pages, you're just getting used to the two characters, really. And it is very much a tale of these characters. Like I say, the plot happens and it's not like the plot happens to them. They do make the plot happen, but the plot definitely comes secondary to the relationship between these two characters. So there's some dialogue here between Lenny and George. So and basically Lenny is a bit slow. He would be perfect for my punk rock tag where uh, the question was um, name someone who's pretty vacant. Lenny from A Voice of Men, definitely. But anyway. Let's do this. Come on, George. Tell me, please, George, like you've done before. You get a kick out of that, don't you? All right, I'll tell you, and then we'll eat our supper. George's voice became deeper. He repeated his words rhythmically as though he had said them many times before. Guys like us that work on ranches are the loneliest guys in the world. They got no family. They don't belong no place. They come to a ranch and work up a stake, and then they go into town and blow their stake, and the first thing you know, they're pounding their tail on some other ranch. They ain't got nothing to look ahead to. And that's very much a theme throughout this novel and eventually they do come up with a plan to kind of break that and uh, yeah, as, as you might guess from the title, the best laid plans of mice and men off go awry, so, so what happens there? Now as it was first published in, what did I say, was it 1937 was it? Yeah, first published in 1937, you can see the changing attitudes, in particularly in Steinbeck's use of what I'm going to call here the N-word. So I start keeping a count of how many times that word was used, so we're up to two so far. On this page, it's used five times in this one paragraph here. Now, I personally, I'm not too bothered about it, and I can overlook it for this because you could remove it all and the plot would still make sense and it would still be a great book without that being in there. So it's not like the story itself is inherently racist, which was my problem with The Sign of the Four when I reviewed that. Like, it, it's just the way it was spoken back then, I suppose. But it is still unsettling. Unsettling enough that I kept a score count. So we're up to seven so far. We have this weird thing where Curly, who is, he's like, runs the ranch, and his wife is the one that's kind of, they portray as very sexually promiscuous, but we don't really get to see it from her side of the story, so it's portrayed as though, you know, she's given the eyes at the men and all this stuff, but it's the men that are saying that, so I kind of think that she wasn't. <laughs> the rumour goes around that Curly is keeping his hands in gloves covered in Vaseline to keep them soft for his wife. Well, we've got another add-on for that word, so that brings us up to eight. Then they're talking about giving uh, Lenny a puppy. But the problem is, is Lenny kills things by accident. He's not aware of his own strength, so he, he they don't, it's not that such a good idea to give him a puppy. But at the same time, it's so sweet that you do want him to have a puppy, because you know how much it will make him happy. We have another count for that word, that brings us up to nine. So they come up with this plan, and, and what I really like is, 
The thing they had never really believed in was coming true. George said reverently, Jesus Christ, I bet we could swing her. His eyes were full of wonder. I bet we could swing her, he repeated softly. Spoiler alert, they don't swing her. I'm not going to tell you what it is though, because I don't want to ruin it. We have a great demonstration of Lenny not being aware of his own strength. And it's kind of sad because he doesn't, he doesn't even understand how it's a problem, you know. He's the true gentle giant. All right, we have two more, so that brings the count up to 11 uses. We have a point where we actually speak to this black guy as well, and um, he says, guys don't come into a colored man's room very much. Nobody been here but Slim, Slim and the boss. They talk about going to the whorehouses and stuff. So you can see why this would have been controversial at the time, you know. Up to 12 mentions of that word, 13. 14. The problem is, is as a modern reader, it just jars me out of it. I mean, I know you you can argue all you want that it was, you know, acceptable at the time and whatnot. But the problem is, is that I'm reading it in the context of now. So that changes it for me, you know. Then Lenny kills the puppy, which kind of foreshadows the ending. But equally, you always knew it was going to happen as well. And then when he does the really bad thing, he says, he crouched down in the hay and listened. I'd done a real bad thing, he said. I shouldn't have did that. George will be mad. And he said, and hide in the brush until he come. He's going to be mad in the brush till he come. That's what he said. And then they're arguing as well after this happens. So Lenny goes on the run, basically. And they're arguing about what they're going to do with him. And it's kind of turning into a lynching kind of situation. And it's, it's not good. But equally, that just makes me think of the 14 times he used the word. Yeah, no. I, no, we're, we're over that now. There aren't any more mentions of it. Although that does still equate to about one every eight pages or something, which is quite a lot. Especially that one paragraph with five of them. I'm just reading it going... And then we get to the ending. And my God, the ending. Because I guess I was spoiled for part of it from the intro essay, but I wasn't spoiled the actual ending. But I did see it coming still. And it was so sad. But it was, it was the perfect ending, I think. And even these, right, these, the last, the last couple of lines of it, if nothing else convinces you to buy this book, I hope it's these last two lines because they're such powerful lines. And especially given the context of the rest of the book. Curly and Carlson looked after them and Carlson said, now what the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? If you've read this book, you, you probably understand the significance of those two lines. I, I was very impressed by the end. I, th I thought, like, the, although, you know, like I said, although I kind of saw it coming, it was because I saw it coming because I was like, he, he could set up this perfect ending here. He could do this. He could do this. And then he did it. And I was like, yes, there is like, I can't see. I cannot think of a single better way this could have ended. And, and also, I, I imagine quite a lot of people will get really annoyed by this ending. <laughs> it's one of those... It's one of those endings you got to talk about, I think. And for me, it really worked. So there were some problems with it, but overall, cracking book, great place to get started with classics. I'm going to give it a 4.5 out of 5 stars. My girlfriend is outside and waiting to come in, so I'm quickly going to sign this off now. So thanks a lot for watching. If you've read of Mice and Men, let me know with a comment what you thought of it. Don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe for more bookish videos if you'd like to see some more. And I will see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.